Amen. Amen. Let's do one of those hops tonight. Let's all stand on our feet. Grab your song books. Let's sing number 44. Hymn number 44. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Sing it out, church. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate all. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Ye chosen seed of Israel's race, ye ransom from Hymn number 122, send the light, send the blessed gospel light. Amen. Sing it out this evening. There's a call come ringing for the restless way, send the light. Send the light, send the light. 
One thing I like about not leading the singers, I can do the echo, amen. I enjoy that, but uh, amen. Let's go to the Lord of Prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for just a wonderful day to be in the house of God. Thank you that there are still those that want to meet with you and hear from you. And I pray you would bless them tonight. Pray for those that are here that you would give them what they need, give them the help that they require. And I pray for those that are watching that are not able to come because of sickness or other reasons that you give them what they need as well. And I pray for those, Lord, that should be in church that are not, that you would bring conviction upon their heart to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. And I pray you'd bless in this service. We need you. We need your help. We need your guidance. And we just want to turn to you and ask for that help. In Jesus' precious name, amen and amen. You all may be seated. Boy, it's good to see everybody tonight. And, um, amen. A couple of things to go over. Easter is coming quickly. It will be upon us. Uh, you say, oh, I don't, it's not going to come that quickly. Could you already imagine it would be in March already? Uh, it has flown by. And so, uh, it's going to fly by. March will fly by. And April will be here before you know it. And uh, so, you be in prayer. Uh, we're looking to have a very, very special service that day. And special things that we do, uh, hopefully be able to celebrate a little bit more like we normally do uh, on Easter. And uh, just just centering on the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And so you pray about that. We'll give more details of time as we get closer as to what we'll be doing. Time of service and all that stuff as we get closer. But be in prayer for Easter that uh, the Lord would make it possible for us to... Uh, celebrate together in a very unique and special way. Uh, also, we are beginning uh, next Sunday, uh, beginning fundraising. We need a new bus. Uh, our van is also getting to the place where not long down the road is going to need a replacement as well. And so we're going to be doing a vehicle fundraiser. Uh, we're going to uh, look to... Uh, I'm praying the trend that we're seeing keeps going because this is the trend. We're going down with the virus. We want to pray that it keeps going right. into oblivion. And, um, and so uh, I thank the Lord for that. And if that is the case, if it keeps going, we need to be prepared, hopefully in the not too distant future, yes. to start running the bus again yeah. and the vehicles again. Yes. And uh, we'll take it step by step. But... Um, let's not wait until the last minute and then try to get ready. So let's get ourselves another vehicle and, um, and by the grace of God, uh, fill it up with people riding to church. Won't that be wonderful again? I, I may just cry the first day that I see kids walking through that door over there again. Amen. I'm tired of just seeing the cockroaches. We need kids. Amen. <laughs> I get myself in trouble all the time. Uh, but, uh. I do. I get tired of killing them over there. Eh? <laughs> but we're looking forward. I look forward to the day that every one of those rooms has kids in them again and uh, teachers that are excited about serving the Lord. But we're going to start the process of getting ready for it. And, um, and so um, we need to get ourselves another bus. And we're going to start working on that. Um, so all I'm asking you to do this week is just pray and ask God to guide you on how much you should help with that fundraiser. Uh, here's the thing, folks. They're talking now, big news is, is, is stock market and investments and, and Bitcoin is all through the roof with its, with its value and all that stuff. All that investment is temporary. Right. I'm not against people having investment for retirement and, and being wise. I don't have a problem with that. But you do realize it's temporary, right? You do realize that it's only going to last a certain amount of time. And if we believe the Lord is coming back, it's not going to last long. But you know what is an eternal investment? In the souls of men. Investment in the souls of boys and girls. And men and women and teenagers. And that bus ministry has brought people to church that could not normally come to church for years. And all those souls are an investment. 
So when you give, you're not just given to buy a bus. You're investing in the gospel. Laying for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not corrupt. And so uh, looking forward to it. You'd be praying about what the Lord would have you to do and how the Lord would have you to participate. And uh, I've already been praying. I have a figure in my mind that I'd like to give, but I'm going to the Lord and finding out what his mind is. And so uh, you do the same thing this week and let's raise the funds and get some vehicles and continue on. You say, when should the bus ministry stop? Well, when the rapture happens. Right. When the church is gone. You know, um, I don't think we should be stopping. Um, we've had a pause for a while. We can get going again. Yeah. Get started again. Get rolling again. And so you pray for that and you help us make that a reality. Amen. Uh, that's exciting. Brother, some more singing. As we remain seated, let's turn to hymn number 139. Hymn number 139. Our best, our all.
M174, look for me at Jesus' feet. Sing it out, church. If I leave this world of sorrow sometime before you do, just look for me in heaven and we'll talk. be seated. How many of that's the first time you'd heard that one? That's good, isn't it? Just uh, be a good meeting place, right? Yeah, Not looking at some mansion or weather, but at the feet of Jesus. Boy, that's good. I like that. Hey, Amen. That's good. That's good. I appreciate it. Those last two songs are a song I haven't sung in a while. So that was a blessing. I enjoyed that. Enjoyed that. Hey, Amen. All right. Anybody got a request they'd like to give? Oh, I caught you by surprise. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> We're going to do some requests. We're going to do some scripture songs, different things, just a little bit. Have a good time tonight. So anybody want to get us started with a request? Amen. Caught you by surprise. Amen. Just give the last song and we'll re-sing it. And, you know, Number one. What's that? Number one. Number one. Amen. <laughs> Amen. My Savior's love. <laughs> I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene 
and wonder how he can love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. Remember the Roy? 168. Hey, man, let's go to 168. 168. Match it over the hilltop. Hey, Amen. Good. I'm satisfied with just the cottage below. A little silver and a little gold. Where the ransom will shine I want a gold one That's never more wander But walk on streets that Are purest gold With that, we'll come back to request Got some songs about heaven We're singing uh, How many of you remember the old chorus Soon and very soon? But you know that one? It's very simple. It goes, soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We're going to see the king. Words aren't too hard, right? Pretty simple. Then there's no more crying there. No more dying there. Amen. So let's start again. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we're going to see the King. No more crying there, no more crying there. We are going to see the King. No more crying there, we are going to see the King. No more crying there. We are going to see the King. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We're going to see the King. No more dying there. No more dying there. We are going to see the King. No more dying there. We are going to see the King. No more dying there. We are going to see the King. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We're going to see the King. Amen. I'm looking forward to that day. Amen. Amen. No more dying, no more crying. Amen. Another request. I'll go, Brother Trey, and then we'll come back over this way. Amen, brother. 554. 554. I don't think I should give you a chance. You get to pick the songs all the time. <laughs> <laughs> 554 Okay Once my soul was astray From the heavenly way And was wretched and vile As could be But my Savior in love Gave me peace from above when he reached down his hand for me that's good when my savior reached down for me when he reached way down for me I was lost and undone without God when he reached down his hand for me. Amen. You know 
don't have to preach after this, right? Give me all those high songs, amen. <laughs> amen. Sister Ruth? 185. 185. 185. <laughs> My Savior, first of all. When the bright and glorious morning I shall see I shall know my Redeemer when I reach the other side And His smile will be the bird to welcome me I shall know Him, I shall know Him And redeemed by His side I shall stand I shall know By the print of the nails in his hand. That's good, amen. I forgot how to get it started, though. Thank you all for helping. Amen. All right. Anybody else? Sister? 75. Page number 75. Page number 75. Rejoice in the Lord. God never moves without purpose or plan. It's a good one. Amen. God. Without purpose or plan When trying his servant And molding a man Give thanks to the Lord Though your testing seems long In darkness he giveth a song Oh rejoice in the Lord he makes no mistake, he knows with the end of each path that I take. For when I am tried and purified, I shall come forth as old. Amen. I need to stop there because my voice is going to go on. Amen. That's good though. Did I, ever, did I ever tell you that I really like our songbooks, amen? <laughs> I really do. It's got great songs. Amen. <laughs> amen. Turn to Psalm 32 tonight. In my, let me go ahead and flip over, brother. In my, um, in my personal devotions this year, I, I haven't, um, I haven't been going on a straight through the Bible plan. I've been doing some jumping around, and um, I've done some, um, some in the, the history books. Uh, you probably noticed I had some messages out of there, amen. And uh, been reading some in the prophets. Uh, right now, kind of been in the in the Old Testament, and uh, and then and then in between, I'll also read Psalms and study Psalms and these these little Psalms here. Um, I've uh, really gotten some help from chapter 28 and 29 of Psalms, different ones. And uh, chapter 32 is a really good Psalm too. And I just wanted to touch on it tonight, give you some thoughts out of Psalm 32. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. When I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer, Selah. I acknowledge my sin unto thee. My iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin, Selah. For this shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Surely in the floods of great waters... They shall not come nigh unto him. Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt come past me about with songs of deliverance, Selah. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. Be ye not as the horse or as the mule, which have no understanding, 
whose mouth must be held in with bit and bridle, lest they come near unto thee. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he that trusteth in the Lord, mercy shall come past him about. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, ye righteous, and shout for joy, all ye that are upright in heart. As you read this psalm, um, there, there is an uh, application um, to the lost man here. I mean, when my sins were, for, were, were my transgressions were forgiven and my sins were covered, um, and when uh, iniquity was not imputed unto me, uh, in my salvation, that was a wonderful thing. That was a blessing. Amen. It's a blessing to have your sins forgiven. But when you look closer here and you, and you look at the context, um, you look at the first few verses and then look what it says in verse number six. For this shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. So the things that he's talking about in the verses before really are being addressed to the godly. And so yes, when we are saved, uh, our transgression is forgiven. Our sin is covered. Uh, the Lord imputeth not iniquity uh, unto us. Th that is true. But you know as well as I do that Christians, though we are forgiven and our standing in Christ is secure, we can go back to the pig pen. We can go back to the slop. Bible uses the comparison of the dog going back to its vomit. We can go back to the things that we've been saved from and dirty up our life. Our security and our standing in Christ is sure. I am forgiven for eternity. Uh, so in, in, my, in my eternal condition, I am washed in the blood. But when it comes to my fellowship with God, when it comes to my standing in the family of God, my relationship in the family of God, we can fall back into sin. We can fall back into sin. Doesn't get us kicked out of the family, but it is still wrong in God's sight. Right. And it is still, uh, uh, it, you go from condemnation and judgment to correction by God. Uh, your children are your children. They are in your family. But when they do wrong, you still discipline them. And when they do wrong, there's still a break in fellowship. And so you need to realize that though you are in your standing and in your position in Christ secure, you can break your fellowship with God. You can be crossways with God. And sin is still sin even if you're a Christian. Immorality didn't change in your life just because you got saved. Well, I'm saved now, so immorality doesn't mean the same thing. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Uh, whatever sin. A thief is a thief, saved or not. A thief is a thief. Bad words are still bad words whether you're saved or not. Yes, eternally, your sin is washed, forgiven, gone. But you sure can dirty up your life here on earth. You sure can dirty it up. I, uh, I think of that, that uh, you know, that, that cartoon uh, uh, Snoopy, or what they call Peanuts. And y'all remember Pig Pan? One of my favorite pictures of him is he is all cleaned up and slicked down. His hair, you know how they would always have them, their hair slicked down and... He's all clean in one picture. In the next picture, it shows him standing on the front steps. And in the next picture, he is just that all swirling dirt that he, that he had. And that's a lot of Christians. The Lord Jesus Christ saved us, washed us, cleaned us, gave us eternity, gave us a home in heaven, gave us settled position in Christ, and yet we're a swirling dirt of sin. And you know what the world sees? The world doesn't see you're standing in Christ. The world sees that swirling dirt that's hanging on to you, your sin. That's what the world sees. The world doesn't know whether you're saved or not. The world doesn't even understand about being saved or not. 
But what they do know is a Christian that's living for God or a Christian that's walked out and there's dirt swirling all around them. The sin that so easily besets us. So when we're dealing here, this, by the way, if you're ever preaching this, you can apply it to the lost man. You can. But this is talking about the Christian. And I don't know about you, but I want to be blessed. Um, blessing is better than the opposite. Because what's the opposite of blessing? Cursing. Being cursed, right? Cursing. Being cursed. I don't want to be cursed. I've seen in the Bible what it means to be cursed by God. I've seen that. Uh, do any of us want Egypt's plagues? No. I've seen in the Bible what happens when God's people become accursed. When God's people are removed from the blessings of God. I want to be blessed. But we have to, once again, we always have to be careful about the modern idea of blessing. There are people that would look at the United States still full of money. We're not full of money. We're full of pretend money. Because we're so far in debt, there's no paying it back. Uh, you know, it, it's, but, but we, we have the appearance of prosperity in the United States. I'm not talking about right now. Even with, it's an amazing thing, but even with the pandemic, as high as the unemployment rate got in the United States, we weren't even where most other countries were before the pandemic. So we look at that and we go, it's a blessed nation. Really? Do we really consider that a blessing? That we're so wrapped up in materialism and we're killing babies? Mm -hmm. And we're celebrating all kinds of wickedness in this, in this country? And we as Christians... When we think of being blessed, it's always those blessings of, of uh, it's always those blessings of, uh, of material things. And by the way, when God blesses you with some, uh, some type of material thing, thank him for it. Be grateful for it. I'm grateful that I have a nice recliner to sit in. It's a blessing. It's a blessing. I'm grateful that we have a nice home. I was sure grateful for heat a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> I'm real grateful for right now for air conditioning. But when we only focus on that, we miss out on some of the greater blessings of life. And here's a blessing of life. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Now, once again, tonight we can praise God for our salvation. And that's a blessing. Amen? Amen. That's a real blessing. Amen? Amen. It's, ble it's a blessing to know your transgression is forgiven and your sin is covered. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. But what about in your Christian life? A Christian living in sin is a miserable creature. Because if you're truly saved, don't you have the Holy Spirit dwelling within you? Yes. Don't you have him working on your conscience? Don't you have him working on your heart? A Christian that is living in sin is a miserable creature. Now, the longer you stay in sin, the more you can grow calloused and cold and and, and sear your conscience and, and all those things that you can do. But the truth is, when a Christian is out of the will of God, it's a miserable place to be. But when a Christian gets right with God, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. This isn't just applying to our salvation this is applying to in your Christian life when you fall into transgression, when you fall into sin, when that sin is forgiven, when you come back to God in repentance. Oh, think about the prodigal son. He seemed like he was having a good time out there in the world, didn't he? But all that good time came to a crashing end and he ended up miserable in a pig pen. You got to be way down to consider eating what those things eat. 
Anybody here ever worked with pigs? Or known, known farms where they worked with pigs? Um, you ever seen what they throw in that slop? Even if it's good food, as soon as it's thrown in that slop, it's nasty, right? Oh, the pigs love it. But I've never really thought, you know what? I think it'd be a good night to go eat with the pigs. You know? Now, my brother-in-law and I used to call a buffet in Pensacola the pig's palace, but that's a different story. <laughs> amen? That's a different type of, of eating. Amen? But it's, it's, a, it's a miserable place for a Christian. Jonah was okay for a while sleeping at the bottom of the boat, but when they woke him up, that was an embarrassing time for him. As a Christian, to have to sit there and go, I'm the problem. I did wrong. I ran from God. And to have the worldly people looking at him going, why did you do this to us? Miserable. If you're truly saved by the blood and you're not miserable in sin, I'd be real concerned. There's one of two things going on. If you're really not saved or you're starting to get to a place where you are searing your conscience, you're starting to get to a place where you are, you are going hard-hearted. Even Lot, the Bible says, vexed his righteous soul. Even Lot felt guilty in that city. Even Lot felt bad. He wasn't willing to give it up, but even he felt bad in the middle of Sodom. But it's a miserable place, or it should be a miserable place for a Christian. Away from God, falling into transgression, and falling into sin. Transgression, uh, I found this and I like to, transgression is crossing a line. Transgression is defying authority. It's crossing that line. It's, it's, it's those who, it's the little girl that the father took her with him to the, to the gym. He, he had a pick up basketball game and his, the mother had something come up and so he took the little girl with him and and uh, 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 you know how the bleachers have that little corner in the, and they, there was a corner and he told her, he said, stay in that corner. There was a line, play in there. He gave her all kinds of toys. He went and he was playing and he'd keep an eye on her and keep watching her and, and uh, one time he looked over there and there she was just looking at that line, standing up as close to that line as she possibly could. And she stood there and he kept playing a little bit. And then he looked over and he, she saw that he was looking and she went. Christians are always playing too close to the line. We always want to see how close we can get to the world and still somehow be considered spiritual. How can we play around with the world enough? And, you know, how, how can we make something worldly seem spiritual but what we do is eventually you play around and you get too close to the world it started out with lot simply being selfish in the direction that he chose to go and then the second step was he pitched his tent towards sodom and then the next thing you know where was he in sodom we just play close to that line, get close to that line, play around with the things. We, we want to get as close as we can without actually stepping across. But the more you play close to the line, the easier it becomes to step across the line and fall into transgression. Sin, uh, there's many definitions, but sin has the idea of falling short and missing the mark. Falling short and missing the mark. For all have sinned and what? Come short of the glory of God. Part of being a sinner is falling short, not making the mark. God has high standards for his children. High standards. You say, how high, how, how high are the standards of God? Be ye holy, for I am holy. That's a real high standard, right? That's right. And on our own and without him, you will never, never reach that mark. But with the Holy Spirit of God, you can live a holy life. But when we are not living a holy life, you know what that is? It's sin. It's transgression. 
And a Christian living in sin and living in transgression should be a miserable person. You say, how do I get the blessing of God back on my life? How do I get out of this miserable condition? How do I get out of this miserable state? Christian, I'm here to tell you there is a way, and that is to have your transgressions forgiven and your sin covered. Verse 2, blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. Blessed is the man who imputeth, imputed, uh, 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 is, it's a um, bookkeeping term. Got a couple bookkeepers here. Imputed is when you count it, you put it on their account. When it's not imputed, it's not put on their account. It's not put there. And so how wonderful it is to know that eternally my sins are forgiven and it's not going to go on that eternal account. But what, about that? what about the account you're keeping every day with the Lord? What about the account that you're keeping when it comes to your fellowship with him, when it comes to your standing as a son uh, 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 with him? What about that accounting? Do you know where there's the blessing? When it's not imputed, when you get it right. And notice it says, and in whose spirit there is no guile. Guile is deceit. It's very interesting, but... Um, David, in the book of Psalms, is always refreshingly honest. He's very honest. He's very honest about his own feelings. He's very honest about what he's going through. He's very honest about uh, what, the Lord, what the Lord has done for him. He'll tell you when he's complaining. He'll tell you when he's down. He'll tell you when he's discouraged. He's refreshingly honest. But when he fell into sin, every time he fell into sin, not every time, but every time that we know of here when the, when the Bible reveals the sin. You know what it becomes? Very deceitful. The first time, he goes to uh, the priest and lies about being there by himself. It's deceitful. And what did it end up happening? What ended up happening to that priest and his family? They got killed. Then he went over to the Philistines for help and got afraid. And once again, he had to act like a crazy man. Was he a crazy man? No, he's lying. He's being deceitful. Then, at the end of, of his running, he goes to the king, and he gives the king of, of the Philistines, he gives them a city, and remember what they were doing? They were running around, destroying all these little cities and making sure they killed everybody so nobody could run back and tell them. Deceitful. When we see David's sin, you know what we see? Deceitfulness. A man who, when you read the Psalms, you go, he's really honest. He tells us when he's sad. He tells us when he's happy. He tells us when he's brokenhearted. He tells us when he feels alone. He tells us when he's angry. He tells us when he's discouraged. He, he's, he's honest. But you know what sin made him be? Deceitful. You know what sin will do to a Christian? Make you be deceitful. You'll still dress up. Bring the Bible. Sing the praises, hallelujah, walk out, go home, and be sneaking around doing stuff. But here's the problem with deceitfulness. The problem with deceitfulness is eventually your lies catch up to you. You're, you're constantly worried that somebody's going to see something. You're constantly having to look over your shoulder. Look over, they always talk about that with criminals that they're just constantly having to live their life looking over their shoulder to see if somebody's chasing them, somebody's going to find out, somebody's going to do something. Folks, when you get into sin, your life becomes deceitful. Your spirit becomes full of guile. You fall into transgression. You cross that line. You fall into sin, that falling short, that missing the mark. You fall into iniquity, that crookedness, Another interesting word with iniquity was distortion. You ever heard of the distortion of sound? Your life becomes distorted. Your life becomes crooked. It becomes out of place from what it is. And when you're in that place as a Christian, you miss the blessing. 
And if you stay silent, it'll cause you damage. In the first four verses we see, I'm sorry, in the first two verses, we see a man who is, um, who's blessed because of his transgression, because his transgression has been forgiven, his sins covered, all those things. We see what he had fallen into and what he was brought out of. In the second part, what we see is what happened when he kept silence. Look at verse 3. When I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. Selah. They say when a man is in the desert and he begins to dehydrate, the more he dehydrates, the more his vitality, that's one of the words that was used in connection with this, one of the, his vitality and his strength is weakened, it comes to a point where you don't even sweat anymore. You don't even have moisture anymore. And here it says, for day and night thy hand was heavy upon me, my moisture is turned into the drought of summer. Selah, and what does Selah mean? Think about that. When he kept silent, when he kept silent in his transgression, when he kept silent in his sin, when he kept silent in his iniquity, when he was, had a spirit of guile, and he was silent about it, he says, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. It just was this, this voice in his head. It just was this, this silent scream in his head because he knew he shouldn't be like that. And then in verse 4 it says, for day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. I don't know about you. I don't want the hand. God, I want the hand of God, but I don't want the hand of God heavy on me. I don't want the hand of God heavy on me. I remember I um, never got into many fights um, growing up, and uh, but there was this one time I was a little boy. I don't know. I was maybe <coughs> trying to think about how old I was probably about eight or nine, and uh, this other little boy there, and, and uh, the other kids started to egg us on a little bit. So we started to have a little fight, neither one of us knew how to fight. It looked more like this. We didn't know how to fight. But we were, we were going, of course, with all the kids there, we're making all kinds of noise, right? All kinds of noise, and they're screaming and hollering, and we're, we're pretending like we know what we're doing, and we're bouncing around, and all of a sudden, I'm, I'm intent on what's going on. All of a sudden, I just feel this hand just grab me by the back and pull me up. And I panicked because I knew I was in trouble because I knew they were going to tell my dad. And I fought, and I squirmed, and I, 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 I just, but he just grabbed me, and it was the PE teacher, and he was strong, and he grabbed me. And he held on to me, and as harder I fought, and he finally leaned over and whispered in my ear, if you don't stop, I am going to tell your dad. And he marched me into the principal's office, and I sat down. That other little boy sat down. All I know about that, that at the end of that thing is he did not discipline us. He did not spank us, but he didn't have to. And we walked out best of friends. We were commiserating in our fear, you know, and... Um, I don't know if they ever told my dad. I can't even remember that far back. I'm sure they did. But I think he told them that he took care of it and there was no problem. I don't know exactly. But I, I do know this. I remember that heavy hand. That heavy hand. And I also remember a heavy hand of my dad. And usually the heavy hand of my dad was not empty. It had a belt. It had a paddle. I remember that heavy hand. I don't want God's heavy hand on me. I want to walk hand in hand with him. I don't want the heavy hand of God on me. But when you get away from God as one of his children, he loves you enough to put his heavy hand on you. He as the shepherd loves you enough to break your leg so you won't run again. He as the shepherd cares about you enough to put his heavy hand on. Why? Because he wants to bless you. And he knows that where the blessing is is when you are right with him. But when you are living in sin... And you are in that sin and you keep silence as a Christian. You're inviting the heavy hand of God. You're, you're inviting the, 
the, the, your bones to wax old and the roaring all the day and your moisture to be turned into drought. So how did this man who was living in sin, this man who was keeping silent, how did he get to the place of blessing? Look at the next verses. I acknowledged my sin unto thee, and my iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. And once again, it says, Selah. What did we talk about at the beginning? Transgression, iniquity, and sin, right? Notice in verse number five, I acknowledge my sin and mine iniquity have I not hid. I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. When David stopped being silent about the sin in his life. When David stopped living in the misery of having the hand of God heavy on him, and David got before God and acknowledged his sin and hid, did not hide his iniquity and confessed his transgressions, what happened? Thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin Think about that, folks. So how do you get to the blessing of having the blessing? Got to have your transgression forgiven. You have to have your sin covered. You have to have uh, 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 your iniquity not imputed to your count. And that happens when the Christian no longer keeps silent about their sin, but recognizes their sin, acknowledges their sin, and comes to the God of heaven and asks forgiveness for their sin. And you know what God does? He forgives us and blesses us. Isn't that amazing? Look at verse 6. For this shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come nigh unto him. Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. See law. For this, listen to this, for this shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. The sooner you break your silence about your sin with God, the quicker it is to find him. Sometimes we get so deep into our sin and we just, we lose, we lose all track of God. Brother Danny said this to people. He said this about people. He said, you know, he said, it's always um, been hard when people get out of church to get back into church. He says, but it seems like in this day and age, it's getting even harder. People get out for them to get back in. And his point was, you might as well just stay in. But this world has so many things to offer and so many voices and so many wrong solutions that Christians are looking to. Instead of looking to God when he can be found, we're just digging our hole deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. But no matter how far you are down in that hole, if you cry out, the God of heaven will hear you. But look what it says there also. When thou mayest be found surely in the floods of great waters, they shall not come nigh unto men. This can be applied to literal floods of water, but also, you know, sin can become like an overwhelming flood in our life. And the only way we're going to be rescued from it is through our heavenly Father. And breaking that silence and quit making the excuses and quit covering it up you need to stop covering your sin and let him cover it in his blood. You need to stop making excuses and acknowledge it so that he can forgive it and cover it so you can have the blessing of being forgiven and having your sins covered. Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. Selah. Here's the thing. When you get right with God you can begin to look at him to be your help and your deliverance 
And you can look to him to be a refuge. How are we going to stay away from the sin? Okay, you fell into sin. When you get it right, how are you going to stay away from doing it again? Running to the refuge. Hiding in the refuge. Getting to the Lord Jesus Christ. Staying close to the Lord Jesus Christ. Allowing him to preserve you from trouble. I love where it says, Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance, Selah. When you're not living right, the songs just aren't the same, are they? When you're not walking right with God, the songs just don't sound the same. But boy, when you get right with God, those songs of deliverance will surround you. I, I've talked about the last, last two, three weeks, Oh, the singing here has been good. It's been good. Wasn't that good tonight? The different requests and those newer songs, songs we hadn't sung in a long time. And, and joy, just to be surrounded by that good songs of deliverance. I'll tell you, songs will get you out of trouble. The right types of songs. The wrong type of songs will get you into trouble. The right types of songs will help deliver you. And then God says this, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. And then look at verse nine. Be ye not as the horse or as the mule, which have no understanding, whose mouth must be held in with bit and bridle, lest they come near unto thee. Here's what God says. Stop being so stubborn. Stop being someone that, that doesn't learn, someone that has to be held in check all the time. Somebody that, uh, by the way, a horse can be controlled by a bridle, right? A, 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 a bit, right? But they talk about when a horse gets its head, it's over. There's so many of us that have to be held in check this way by God. He has to hold on to those reins like this. But there are horses that are so trained and so in tune that the owner doesn't even really have to pull on that very much. They just do what they're supposed to do. I always laugh, tell the story about when we were in, uh, when we were, uh, went across to Mexico and my dad paid a dollar for us to ride a donkey. Those donkeys didn't need to be led. Every donkey except for my dad's. Every, bur every burro except for my dad's. My dad's burro kept going off to the side of the road. Kept pulling off to the side. My dad had to pull it back and pull them up. And me and my, my mother were very sympathetic as we were laughing going down the road. Amen. Thinking, couldn't have happened to a better fellow. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but, but those, two of those donkeys, they just, they listened, they knew the road, they had followed the instructions, they knew right where to go, they walked right into town or walked right up to a pole. That other donkey, my dad kept having to, pull him back and pull him back and he was ornery and he was, he was, he was, he, he just, and that is a lot of Christians that God wants to guide you, God wants to direct you, but we want our head. We want to do it our way. We want to go our way. We want to go and live how we want to live and fall into sin that we want to fall into sin too. And then what does God have to do? God has to pull on the bridle. Pull on the bit. And he says, don't be like that. Don't be like that. Be submissive to the Lord. Learn to submit yourself and just obey God. So you don't have to have that bridle pulled all the time, that bit pulled all the time. You pull that, by the way, you pull that bit long enough, it'll cause bleeding. It'll cause, it'll cause problems with the horse's mouth. Why do we have to be pulled? What we ought to do is get right with God, humble ourselves with God and let him instruct us and teach us and guide us and not be stubborn like the horse or the mule that has to be led around with no understanding. Then he has the contrast, verse 10 and 11. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, 
But he that trusteth in the Lord, mercy shall come past him about. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, ye righteous, and shout for joy, all ye that are upright in heart. When David was crossways with God, his bones were growing old, he had roaring all the night, his strength was gone, the, the, the sweat was gone, and the heavy hand of God was upon him, and he did not feel blessed. But when David broke his silence and got right with God, Whatever the situation was here, we don't know if this is a continuation with Bathsheba. There's no, it doesn't really tell us what was going on in David's life or when this was. But we do know this about this psalm. Something had gone on in his life. But when he broke his silence and he humbled himself before his God and he got right with God and began to let God lead him, one of the things he did ask in Psalm 51 is that he would restore the joy of his salvation. And here in verse number uh, 11, it says, Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, ye righteous, and shout for joy, all ye that are upright in heart. It's just better living when you're right with God. Just better living. There's more blessing when you're right with God. But when we're stubborn and we drag our feet on getting right with God, there's misery and a bridle and a bit in our mouth. I'd rather just be right with God, walking with him, following his instruction. I don't know what it is in your life tonight that you're being stubborn about. I don't know. I don't know what it is exactly that's going on in everybody's life. I don't know every story. Some, but not all. But I think everybody in this room ought to examine themselves. And there may be some things in your life, some transgressions, some sin, some iniquity that you tonight just need to break your silence and get right with God so that you can return to rejoicing and blessing. Heavenly Father, help us tonight. Thank you for this psalm. Thank you for the help that it gave me in my life. Lord, I pray that tonight there'd be some Christians that would just break the silence. Just break the silence. In Jesus' precious name. Christian, why don't you take a moment and reflect and look in your heart and the things that you've been holding on to that you have not gotten taken care of with the Lord, why don't you just make tonight the opportunity to get right with God? Don't you want the blessings of God? Don't you want the joy of the upright? Aren't you tired of the heavy hand of God being on you in that area of your life? You can be doing a lot of things right, but I'm here to tell you this. What God wants us to do is be right in all areas. So if you've got some sin that you need to get right tonight, be a sure it'll be a good time to break your silence before the Lord. Oh, if I, if I go down there, then people will think I'm going to be, I'm, I'm some type of a sinner. Hmm. You might want to come down and get right for your pride. We're all sinners. And there is nothing shameful in getting right with God besides why do you care what we think more than you care what God thinks? You need to find an old-fashioned altar. So let's all stand together. If the Lord spoke to your heart as it begin to play and sing, if you need an altar, here it is. Here it is, folks. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling.
Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to be here. Help us through the rest of the week. Guide and direct and work in a mighty way. I pray, Lord, that we would be willing to break our silence and come to you and get right with you so that you can guide us and teach us and lead us. In Jesus' precious name, amen and amen. Y'all may be seated for just a minute.